we have to talk about something called the psychology of cruelty. Right. In human history throughout, in order to convince a group of people to mistreat or exterminate another group of people, we convince the majority that this minority to be attacked is less than human. Right. We saw it with the Nazis and the Jewish people. Yeah. They were portrayed as rats to the population. Yeah. So that now it's a rat. I can, I can kill a rat, right? Not a human, but I can kill a rat. In Rwanda, we saw this with the genocide. The Tutsis who were being exterminated were being um, called cockroaches. They were presented as these cockroaches that had to be destroyed. And that presentation of them as animals, less than human, the dehumanizing of them, somehow made it eventually okay for people to embrace the psychology of terror and, and let masses of people be killed. And so the same thing happened for slavery. Black people were dehumanized. They were called apes and made less than a person, three-fifths of a person. And they are, they are basically a little higher than apes, but not human. And that dehumanization was necessary to convince people to treat Black people like animals, to keep them as slaves, whether it was in a brutal way, to beat them horribly within an inch of their life, feed them poorly and force them to work, or whether it was in kind of a patronizing way, like having a pet. Oh, yeah. we love our slaves. <laughs> you know, having like they were pets, but whatever it was, they weren't human. And so we have the amendments to the Constitution, and now Black people in America get to be a whole person instead of three-fifths of a person. We Let me just your... jump in. For those of you mm -hmm. from other countries, my reading, this is where mm -hmm. it worked me up. It was actually written in the law that they weren't human, that it was three-fifths of a person. So Dr. Yeah. Anita's not just saying this. This was, like, mm -hmm. written. It, I, I, it just shocked me when I read that. It was shocked me. Yeah, and so even and and just educating people about that who are out of the country, when we would do our census, and we have a census every ten years where we kind of count how many people are in the country, and I'm sure plenty of other countries do that yeah. too. Um, yeah. When the count was made, black people were counted as three fifths, so not one whole person when the count was made, and so they were we were dehumanized. So a piece of paper though doesn't change that. Right. Remember, I talked about how that implicit memory that gets in there, it's not, it's not spoken, it's nonverbal, it's an emotion space, but we absorb it and carry it across generations. Well, I talked about how we've carried great stuff into our faith, but guess what? We carry some ugly stuff too. And so after hundreds of years of dehumanization being a part of the culture of this country, the dehumanization of Black people, that they're dangerous, that they're superhuman strength, that they have an unusual capacity to handle pain. There were incredible, horrific stereotypes said about us and that we didn't have hearts. And that's why you could sell off our children. It didn't matter. It wouldn't hurt us. Like we were like, it was like taking a litter from a dog and sending out the puppies. There would be no issue. Let me just pause because uh -huh. you're, what you're saying, I mean, because it's so, uh, internal i mean it's it's just so part of what you know but i'm saying here i am i came from another country mm -hmm. and when i started reading this stuff, i mean you're just rattling it off it yeah, took me it's my, 20 this books my to go life. this yeah. is real so just help people just for a couple of seconds to understand how were these messages sent all the things that you just said that we were this and this and mm -hmm. where were where were those statements or implications made in american well, history at the, during slavery, they were very explicit. Yes. And we would see drawings with caricatures of black men as apes. It was yeah. very explicit. And I would recommend everybody to please watch a show, a documentary on Netflix called 13th. 13th gives kind of this long history of how the relationship between slavery and black people after slavery and law enforcement evolved it will blow your mind if you have not seen it and you really don't know this story. So please watch 13th. Right. But it was in images, it was in art, it was in movies that always portrayed um, black women as servants and black men as dangerous to white women, these sexual predators that were gonna yeah. rape white women and you had to control them with force. Yeah. And or on the opposite side, we were these docile, you know, the, the patronizing side was that we were these docile people who needed less than people who needed slavery to keep us safe because we couldn't really handle ourselves in the world. So it was better to, to have us be owned and kept safe by our owners. So you have these two extremes. Some slave masters were just extremely cruel to these 
animals that had to be beaten and controlled. And then on the opposite end, you had this kind of patronizing relationship. I remember my daughter and I were in West Virginia. Um, my son had gone to a basketball camp and I like history, obviously. And mm -hmm. I like to visit very old cemeteries in towns. And they're so interesting to me. And so we went to a cemetery there in Lynchburg, Virginia. And there was a statue to some civil war heroes that were heroes to them for the Southern armies. But we saw a, a tombstone where a slave had been buried next to the master. And they, the, the, the family who owned the slave had carved into their tombstone um, that this was their beloved slave who they wanted to be buried next to them. I just, was just like, really? I mean, even in death, this person has to be stuck next to this person <laughs> who treated them like a pet at best and a wild animal at worst, but not, not as a human being. So we want to think that this was history though, right? And yeah. black folks need to get over this and this was then, but it's not then for a couple of reasons. One, it isn't that long ago. Yeah. just want to point it out. I, 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 my grandmother who lived with us when we were growing up, I'm 46 years old, right? My grandmother lived with us when we were growing up. My parents took care of her until she lived with us. My grandmother was born in 1907. And Harriet Tubman, yeah. who ran the Underground Railroad, yeah, died, in, died in 1913. So the grandmother that lived with me all while I was growing up, she just died in the late 90s because she lived to be nearly 100 years old. She, she saw my child, my first child born. She, her lifespan overlapped the lifespan of Harriet Tubman. So first of all, it's not that long ago. Yeah. I just want to point that out. But second, just like when I explained how uh, the implicit memory of our ethnic, African ethnic heritage was able to come through and still is seen in our faith. And we all thought that was so beautiful. Well, sorry to break it to you guys, but when you put dehumanization into a culture, after a while, you don't have to say anything. Wow. It wow. can pass even without memory, just like these other belief systems. And so the American ethnic identity, which was created from some other ethnic identities and then added some spice to make it its own, some of what it added was slavery and the dehumanization of people who were viewed as Black. And you can't just peel it out. It sinks in and there it is. And so it isn't about someone being explicitly racist. We're trying to get our hands on who's racist, you know, and, and there are racists out there. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying they're not, but our focus on trying to find people who are explicitly racist, like they're at home thinking about how to kill a black person. This, that is almost a waste of our time in the sense that it's not gonna solve the larger problem. The larger problem is this dehumanization because it's in the subconscious. And I wanna share two research studies mm -hmm. with you guys to hear about that. So in 20, I believe it was 16, don't quote me on the year, but I, I'll post it later if people want. There was a study done on how black children were viewed as compared to white children, specifically black boys. We, they wanted to see if the innocence that is attributed to children was attributed equally to black boys. And right. it turned out that it was not. And what they did was they had some police officers look at pictures of black boys and white boys and explain and guess how old they were. And consistently the police officers overestimated the age of the black boys by about four and a half years. Wow. So that means I would see a 15 year old and think they were almost 20. Right. That's, That's a amazing. very different response that you should have as an officer to a 15 year old than an almost 20 year old. Yeah. But if this officer is looking at a black boy and overestimating his age, then they're gonna overestimate applications of force. It gets a little worse, a lot worse. When they primed the officers with images of animals, specifically an ape and a cat, and after letting them see the ape, they would then be asked to estimate the age of the boys. They overestimated it even more. Gosh. But they underestimated the age of the white boy at the same time. So the white children remain innocent for so long while yeah. black children are already losing their innocence in childhood through these eyes because they're seen as being older. When they prime them with the cat, like show the cat, then ask the question, the cat had no effect. 
but the ape did. Wow. So here we are in 2016 and can still use a picture of an ape to bring up a not conscious, but very present association with a black boy. And for the officers who overestimated the age of the boys after the priming with the ape, they were able to correlate it directly with violence towards black children in their work. Whoa. So that's real. But it, I'm going to give you something else because what I don't want to do, I'm not here to bash the police. Okay? I'm not here to bash the police. But something is going on. And we need people to believe that. Right. Something is going on. But while we will find police officers who are explicitly racist, we know from their text messages, from their Facebook posts that they're explicitly racist, we will find more often we're going to find them not explicitly racist but this dehumanization is yeah. soaked into the world view and unless it's primed in an experiment we can't find it <laughs> but yeah. i tell you who knows it's there us we know it's there and so we are screaming into this vacuum where no one's hearing us and then when a video comes out it's like well we don't know if they were individually racist and you know all these questions and we're just yeah. Ask the people who are dying, why wouldn't you trust us? But before I go there, I want to say this. There was another study done around the same time. I think they were about two years apart. One was 2014, one was 2016. But the other study tested preschool teachers. Mm -hmm. So they recruited 135 preschool teachers at a conference for teachers. And they had the teachers take, um, involved in a blind experiment. So what they told them was, um, we want you to look for bad behavior in these groups of children on this video. They put a black girl, a black boy, a white girl and a white boy in the video and told the teachers to be on the lookout for bad behavior. The trick here was there was no bad behavior in the videos. But using eye tracking technology, this was a Yale, this study was completed at Yale University. And eye tracking technology showed that the teacher's eyes went straight to the black boy when they told them to be on the lookout for negative behaviors straight to the black boy My when gosh. the experiment was over before they could publish the study they had to let the participants know what it was and then they told the teachers the results the teachers were devastated they didn't know they were doing it and they gave them the option to withdraw their data from the study because of the nature of the study and only one teacher decided not to let her information the others were so ashamed and so stunned that they were like, this information needs to get out there. Wow. And so that means when my son is in preschool, he's being watched more intently for bad behavior. Well, if you're staring at something, eventually you're gonna see something, Person. right? Person. Totally. But if I am never looking at the white boy or the white girl and then even the black girl, so even with blackness, there's something more terrifying about our men in preschool no, and i want to share that preschool study because i wanted to be clear that i'm not just i'm not just coming for the police what i'm saying is that even in the place where you would expect the sweetest people in the world to be preschool yeah, teachers totally it's this there. dehumanization and this expectation of a negative behavior is already there in preschool and it's teaching it's, it's telling the teachers and the police officers and everybody that to expect these things from black people, but it's also telling us. Yeah. So now we have to recover from an image of us, just like a sex abuse survivor. It changes how she sees herself. This can change how we see ourselves. So now we're trying to recover from the trauma that has changed how we see our own selves. And we can, can we live long enough to get that done? because we're also being seen as dangerous. Right. And so when we talk about preschool, that's horrifying because we're shaping it from scratch. But when we talk about people who have the authority and the means to kill, this is dangerous. For sure. So I'm not saying that's anything, it's limited to police officers. It's not racism, it's not discrimination, it's dehumanization. And we've got to get our hands on that.